Today is Wednesday, December 30th, 2020, and I'm your host, Max Gottlich, and I talk about my interpretations and insights into financial markets and the overall global macro economy. Well, it's no secret why the Fed has been begging for more fiscal support with $8 trillion added to the central bank balance sheets just this year alone. And this includes the Fed, the ECB, the BOJ. Uh, you know, the Fed alone purchased $2.4 trillion in treasuries this year. But what happens when interest rates are, you know, are forced to rise? Well, it's simple. It's as simple as central banks, you know, they're going to have to pay higher interest on its reserves. And, you know, the long duration bonds they've been purchasing will fall in value as well. So this is a formula for stagflation, which is essentially an environment with low economic growth and a high inflation rate. In fact, the Fed actually capped the 10-year yield to 250 basis points, or in other words, 2.5% for about 10 years leading up to 1951, I believe, uh, you know, following World War II post-1945, because they knew they couldn't afford higher interest rates on those reserves. Um, and today we have uh, trillions in excess. So they may cap rates again, or they may not, and, and or you know, they'll default. But right now, one in every five companies are zombie companies, and US corporate downgrades continue at a much, much higher rate. So these businesses can't, you know, they can't pay interest expense with operating income because they have too much debt to service to begin with, which says a lot given these record low interest rates, right? It should not be too much of an issue with these record low interest rates, but it is. But of course, everyone believes that stocks are the best hedge against inflation, just like they did in the 70s. But we, you know, we have not seen you know, inflation since then. We haven't seen inflation since the 70s um, so people clearly have forgotten about it and or really aren't even aware of it. And if we do see, say, 2.5% inflation, which, by the way, is a multi-decade record high, then obviously borrowing costs will go higher and mortgage rates will go higher, which you know theoretically should make the Fed want to tighten. And since March, right, since March, we've seen a 12% decline in the U.S. dollar against other currencies and a 7.5% annualized increase in United, you know, UK or United Kingdom house prices. So this supports the fact that dollars are being redirected to sovereign bonds. So really with increasingly massive QE to finance government spending, you know, this will produce the idea of stagflation. Today I wanted to dive into a topic of discussion. And it takes us back to the great financial crisis uh, you know, in 08. And, you know, and even though the legislation was actually approved in 2014, um, you know, it has been enforced since 2015, where the former Fed chair, Paul Volcker, proposed a piece of legislation, and he essentially prohibited banks from you know, conducting short-term oriented proprietary trading of pretty much all asset vehicles with their own accounts, right? And it also limited their own, you know, their their you know, their right to ownership in private equity funds and hedge funds and all the like. And one of the biggest reasons for this was because it was not proven to be beneficial for the clients at all, frankly, because after all, they used customer deposits to invest in hedge funds and private equity funds and other risky trading operations as well. So the Volcker rule is section 619 of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act of 2010. And to ensure the rule, the bank CEOs, you know, they need a, uh, you know, every year um, in writing, they need to attest that their banks are in compliance with the rule, right? They need to comply every. Um, so now, obviously, obviously they can still underwrite and hedge and um, you know trade, and they can even act as 
they can actually even act as a broker for their clients with their approval, but only if it's limited to their own risk and not the insured depositors. That was a big, big problem. Some of us may know about the Glass-Steagall Act in 1999 uh, during the dot-com era, which essentially proposed a division between investment banking and commercial banking. That's the key. The problem was Congress was actually repealed. You know, Congress wasn't <laughs> repealed, but Congress, they repealed the act. So now these banks can actually deploy reserves in the form of deposits without much of any regulatory constraints so they can they can compete internationally so this is where the too big to fail phrase really came into play as but they didn't really care because um, you know they knew if any instabilities were to occur the fed would just bail them out right in the form of moral hazard um, like we saw very much in 2020 with helicopter money. And by the way, for those that are not familiar with Paul Volcker, he is the same guy that raised the Fed funds rate to 20%, uh, more or less, to fight the, um, right, we had that huge inflation surge. Um, and he did this, obviously, to reduce the money and credit supply. And this was going, this was back in 1980, 1981. And the unemployment then surged to 10 percent, uh, along with the same rate of inflation was 10 percent as well. But since the Volcker rule, uh, you know, it can be argued that regulators have kind of eased the rule by lifting requirements and whatnot. Anyway, times of significant euphoria, which is bull markets are born in pessimism, grow on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die on euphoria. All right, everybody, thank you. This will be the last video for the year of 2020. And I know I just got started, but I, you know, I couldn't be happier with the content I'm putting out and all the support I've been getting since the start. And I'm really, really excited to see what 2021 brings to the table. And as always, I am not a financial advisor and everything I say is for informational purposes only. Okay, thank you everyone and have a happy new year.